once again, welcome to Larry and uh, a very enjoyable keynote, I'm sure. Thank you very much. We're going we're gonna to try to make technology work. And I'm going to warn you that um, I'm not going to walk around on the stage because I pace. And I can pretty much guarantee you that I will fall off at some point. It will not be a pretty sight. So while we get the projector ready, um, let me tell you a little bit about, about me and what I do. Um, I'm a college professor at heart. I've been teaching for 37 years. Ooh, OK, we're good with the sound? Maybe we're working on this with the, with the guys. We're, the sound's good. And my interest really is in not in how to implement technology, as you're going to hear a lot, but how people react to technology. So just to show you my, my really high-tech timer here, so I'll know when I'm done, is my iPhone with a clock on it that's sitting here very carefully so that I know what time it is. So technology used to be for just geeks and nerds. And now we've got babies playing with iPhones. We've got young children who are able to, at a very early age, make the television work better than their parents. We've got teenagers who use technology all the time. And in fact, I'm pretty sure that, that they are all texting each other at this point. We have this couple who just got married, and they changed their Facebook status from in a relationship to married. We have even older adults who are learning how to use technology. and even grandparents who are Skyping with their grandchildren. And so what I want to do is introduce you first, if we get this to work, to three of tomorrow's students. So first of all... Okay, this is Cash. He's five, and he has an iPhone at home. And uh, we're trying to see if that, those skills, which I never taught him, he actually just learned to use it on his own, do those skills translate into being able to use an iPad? In other words, is an iPad so simple a five-year-old can use it? So, Cash, you have found a game that you want to play? Okay. So wait, 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 what did you just do? You just touched the screen and you made it go? Okay. What was that you just did? Start. I touched it. Okay. So you just knew how to do that? What? Because I knew. All right. Whoa! Shooting that tree. <laughs> I want to aim at the tree. Whoops, now this is a problem, isn't it? It moves around. What? I'll hold it for you, okay? You can use two hands, too. Uh -huh. now, you're trying to do what? You I'm can trying use... to aim at the guard. Okay, sorry, I messed you up with the two hands advice. You do it how you were doing it. All right, so let's say you don't want to shoot a whole bunch of guys and do. Cash? Yeah. Can you go back to the home screen and put a different game on? Yeah. Okay. What about something else? Maybe this. Oh, what about it? Yes. Oops. Upside down. <laughs> All right. I'm going to help you a little bit on this. Okay, now look at a two-year-old. First time with an iPad. Now I want you to meet my nine-year-old granddaughter, and this is her first experience with an iPad.
What you couldn't hear was her squeals of delight. And this, this is our new generation of learners. So what I'm going to talk about today is a tale of six different generations, all very different, how the young ones gobble a diet of media all day long, how they communicate, how they multitask, their brains, which quite honestly to me is a very scary concept. And I'm going to give you three very simple strategies for educating our young learners that hopefully will help. So first of all, let me talk about generations. We have right now six generations of humans in our world. There is the silent or traditional generation, my grandparents' generation born in the 20s through the 40s. There's the baby boomer generation born from the mid 40s to the 1960s, mid 60s. I'm right in this generation. Generation X born from the mid 60s to the end of the 70s. And then after this, pretty much nobody agrees. But what they do agree on is that the generations are getting shorter and shorter and shorter. And really, they're not generations anymore, they're mini generations. So we have a generation probably born in the 80s called the net generation, labeled by Don Tapscott, who talked about the fact that their main uh, technology that they grew up with was the internet, and the main focus was the internet. We have what we call the I generation, with a little I, thanks to Steve Jobs, for the people born in the 90s, and their technology that they grew up with is the kind of technology like iPhones and Wii's and iPads and things like that. And then we have this new generation that we're calling Gen C for connected. This is a very connected generation that only sees the world through a variety of connections. And partially why we realize this is happening is because the pace of technology is amazingly quick. When you look at consumer research, they talk about a product penetrating society as when it hits 50 million users. And so I want to show you how products have sped up. So for those of us old enough to remember, radio took 38 years to hit 50 million users. Telephone only took 20. Television only took 13. Cell phones, 12. The World Wide Web, 4. iPods, 3. Blogs, 3. MySpace, 2 and a half. Anybody remember MySpace? It used to exist. Facebook took two years, YouTube took only one year, and Angry Birds took just 35 days. <laughs> In 35 days, it was used by 50 million people. So is it any doubt that we're really speeding up our world, that our world is changing radically? Take a look at this list. How many of these are familiar terms to you, familiar products? Not one of them existed before the year 2000. That, to me, is the best explanation of why our young children are so different. And they use them all at the same time. I'm gonna, I, I talk a lot about through comic strips, so I'm going to read this to you because I don't know if you can see this in the back. But this is a comic strip from the United States called Zitz. And this is Jeremy. He's 16, perennially 16. I think he's been 16 for the five years of the comic strip. This is his father. And his father is continually bewildered by Jeremy's use of technology. And he says, hey, Jeremy, what are you watching? And Jeremy says, on which screen? Because the television's on, the laptop is on, and he's on his phone all at the same time. And sometimes technology, to us at least, doesn't make any sense. So I want you to look at this list of spelling words that the teacher is asking the students to copy. So everybody knows LOL, right? That's a common one. How many people know BZ? How about ADR? How about the most important one in the world? POS. How many people know what POS is? No hands. Parent over shoulder. <laughs> if you are a parent, that is one that you need to know. Very important. So part of what we have been studying really for the last 25 years is how technology is being used. And what we're interested in is tracking people over time and looking how the world is changing, looking how our world is getting different. So baby boomers typically use about eight hours of technology a day. Now, first of all, I have to warn you, that's not eight separate hours because a lot of that overlaps. And you'll see that in a minute when we start talking about multitasking. But eight hours a day. Generation X uses technology 15 hours a day. Again a lot of them at the same time. You'll see that now. The net generation, 
21 hours a day, the I generation 21 hours a day, and even our little Gen C kids are using technology 10 hours a day. So what we look at are technologies that are used two hours a day or more. So baby boomers, the only one is television. How many baby boomers do we have, by the way? All right, there's more than me, that's good. I'm usually the only one. Generation X, music is used two hours or more a day, computers, television, going online. How many Gen Xers do we have, born between the mid-1960s and late 70s? You can give yourself a round of applause, that's good. Net Gener, we have any Net Generation born in the 90s? I mean, in the, in, in the sorry, born in the 80s? Okay, few. Music, television, going online. Now, what about our students? Oh, sorry, I forgot texting. What about our, our young learners, our young students? I generation, do we have any I Geners born in the 90s here? This must be some of the students in the back that are born in the 90s. So music, texting, going online, Facebooking, instant messaging, and chatting. And then for the, even the young Gen Cs, they're just two, television and video games. So you can see that the generations really differ in the kinds of technologies they use and how much they use them. They also communicate very differently. Um, again, Jeremy now talking to his mother, who I think is more bewildered than his father, and she says, Jeremy, why aren't you answering your phone? He says, well, it's probably nothing. How do you know? What if it's important? If it was important, they'd text me. And if you have children, particularly preteen and teenage children, how many people have preteen and teenage children here? Okay, then you, then you know this. My daughter is 22, my youngest one, and if I want to reach her, how do I get in touch with her? I have to text her, because even if I want to call her, she doesn't answer the phone. In fact, the icon on her iPhone, I think, says infinity for phone calls, because the only way I can connect to her is to text her and say, I'm going to call you in a minute, please answer your phone. Texting is a very important part of how they communicate. And I want to show you some of the statistics that we found from some of our research. Oh, by the way, I should say, in terms of, if you want to take notes, that's great, but we're going to post all of the PowerPoint slides so that you'll be able to download them at your leisure, and so don't worry. We did a, a couple of studies where we asked people, which way would you prefer to communicate with your best friends? Baby boomers, number one, face-to-face, -face, the old way of communicating. Second choice, telephone. Distant third choice, email. For the Gen Xers, again, born between the mid-60s and late-70s, face-to-face -face is number one. Telephone is number two. Email is a closer third. And now we get to these two new generations. The net generation still believes in face-to-face -face communication is number one, but texting now is number two. Telephone is a distant third. And the I generation is totally different. When you ask iGeners how they would like to communicate, texting is absolutely number one. 40% of them said our preferred mode of communication is through text messages. Second was a tie between instant messaging, Facebooking, and talking on the telephone, and a distant, distant, distant third, only 20% said they would prefer to communicate face to face. That's a very different lifestyle and that's a very different way of looking at the world. Um, I'm gonna be talking a lot in my workshop tomorrow about what that means about how we communicate with our young learners, but I'm gonna talk a little bit today about that too. In the United States, we have a group called the Nielsen Company. I, the Nielsen Company is very famous for do, putting little devices on people's television sets to figure out what each person is watching at any given time of the day or night. They use those ratings in order to decide whether to keep a television program or to cancel it. What most people don't know is since the early, um, early 2007, they've been collecting 60,000 telephone bills from teenagers and compiling how many phone calls they make and receive and how many text messages they send and receive. So the bottom line, the blue line, are phone calls. And you can see back in the early 2007, it started in the 250s, 
they were making 250, making and receiving 250 phone calls. And you can see it's been pretty steady, actually decreasing down into the high, two, uh, high 100s at 2009 and the latest statistics from the end of 2011. So they make and receive about 200, roughly, phone calls a month. Text messaging is the gold line, and you can see it is going nuts. It has gone crazy such that at the end of 2011, the typical teenager sent and received 3,417 text messages. That, by the way, is six per every waking hour. And I say waking with quotes around it because kids don't just text when they're awake, they actually text when they're asleep. If you're a girl, almost 4,000 text messages a month. So we're looking at technology that is clearly important in their world. And has this led to multitasking madness? And by the way, these pictures I didn't take, but people send me pictures. On the left, this little kid is talking on two telephones at the same time, one to each grandmother. Figured maybe it was an economy of talking or something. He was talking to each grandmother. And this little girl was playing a game, and she was so wrapped up in it that she was being potty trained that she had to take her laptop with her. And at the Consumer Electronics Show, which was just completed in Las Vegas this last year, meet the brand new iPotty. <laughs> this is the newest product. It has a slot for your iPad. And this is the way that they expect you to be able to potty train your kids. Why? Because the iPad is so exciting to kids that they will even potty train faster if they can have their iPad. So one of the things that I'm very interested in, and in fact, this is probably my primary topic that I study, is what people call multitasking. And it's really, I'm going to tell you in a few minutes, that it's not multitasking at all. If we look at the brain, it's something very different. But in our studies, <clears throat> we have asked people of all ages, all the way from baby boomers down to young kids, even four to eight-year-olds. And the question is very simple. Imagine that you have free time. Imagine you have no schoolwork, you have no dinners to prepare, you have no children to take care of. Imagine that you have free time. Which of the following things would you be doing at the same time? And we give them a long list. Would you be going online? Would you be on Facebook? Would you be playing a game? Would you be um, getting a snack? Would you be having a cup of coffee? We give them a list of all sorts of things, some technological, some not. And you can see, for the baby boomers, they tell us that they will do between four and five things at the same time. In a minute, I'll show you what they do. Gen Xers say they'll be doing between five and six. Net Geners say they'll be doing six. Our older teenagers say they, they think they can do seven things at the same time. The younger teenagers are a little more realistic, but not too much. They say they can do six and a half at the same time. The preteen Generation C say they can do almost six. And the little kids, even the youngest ones, think they can do between three and four things at the same time. They are really not doing multitasking. If you look at research on multitasking, you can't multitask. I'm sorry. There are certain things you can do. You can walk and chew gum. Yes, that's multitasking. But you cannot do any tasks that take any mental ability at the same time. What's happening is that instead of doing both of them at the same time, if we're watching your brain, and I'll show you some scans in a second, if we're watching your brain, what you are doing is working on one and then switching and working on another, and then switching and working on another, and switching and working on another. They call this continuous partial attention, which is what we're seeing in our young learners. They are not spending time focusing on anything in any kind of depth. They are continually devoting a little bit of attention here, 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 back and forth and back and forth. So let me ask you a question, show of hands. Can you eat and play a board game at the same time? How many people can do that? OK. Can you read a book and listen to music at the same time? I find that one very difficult. I think it's because I'm old. Can you surf the internet and listen to music at the same time? I bet most of you can do that. Can you read a book and watch TV at the same time? How about read a book and talk on the phone at the same time? <laughs> a few of you can. 
How about read a book, text, Facebook, listen to music with the TV on? Mm, I see one hand here. Are you 14? <laughs> Kids will tell you that they can do these things all at the same time. This is their world. They claim they can do them all at the same time, and they certainly try to. Are they really multitasking? In fact, what their brains are doing is what's called task switching, meaning the way the brain works in a very simplistic way, and I'll give you some more visions of the brain in a few minutes, the way the brain works simplistically is that there's a certain amount of blood running around in your brain, and the blood carries oxygen to certain areas of your brain. In order for your brain to have neurons firing, it needs that oxygen. That's its source of food. There's only a certain amount of blood in your brain to carry oxygen. So if the blood carries oxygen in your brain over here, and then all of a sudden you switch to something else, it has to carry all that oxygen through the blood over to here, and then back over to here, and back over to here, and back over to here. And in fact, it's not a very effective tool because it doesn't carry it immediately. It carries it relatively slowly. So in fact, what happens is you switch from one task to the other, slowly back to the other, slowly back to the other, and back and forth and back and forth. What kids do is in that period of time that it takes to, for the blood flow to go from here to here, they call that slack time. Could be a few seconds, could be a few minutes. They use that slack time to do whatever they want to do. And if you watch kids, it's very interesting. If they wait for a website to load and it takes two seconds to load, what they will do is while it's loading, they'll send a text message. That's slack time. Or while it's loading, they'll flip to another website and load that. Or they'll load up a video to get ready to watch. So they make use of these little microseconds to do another task, but they're really not doing them very deeply. They're actually doing them fairly shallow. Technology itself makes them task switch. Let's see if this works. Sounds, vibrations, and visual displays are all responsible. That's a new, I don't like using those things, but it seemed like so much fun to throw it in. All of those things are what make them task switch. So if you watch a teenager, all of a sudden you'll notice that they'll pull something out of their pocket because perhaps their pocket vibrated and they got a text message. Or they'll hear, hear a sound while they're on their computer, meaning they got an email or somebody posted something on Facebook. All of these kinds of external distractions are what drive the way their attention goes. But there's cost to this. And the costs are serious costs, I think, because first of all, they're not attending. They're not attending to anything deeply because they're continually switching back and forth and back and forth. This means they're making poor decisions because they're only making decisions based on a little bit of information. Just as a guess, how many seconds do you think a typical teenager will wait for a website to load before switching to another website? Any guess? Two, two seconds. The answer is two seconds. An average of two seconds. So how good a decision can they make in two seconds as to which website might have valuable information? they will immediately switch from one to another. Obviously, they're only getting a breath look at the material. They're not going in depth at all. We find that in study after study. They have information overload because they don't just have one website open, they have dozens, and you'll see some data on that. They get addicted to the internet because it has addictive powers. It impacts their sleep habits. We find that the average teenager sleeps about six hours per night during the school week and about 10 plus hours per night on the weekend trying to make up for it, but they run on about a 12 hour per week sleep debt. And your brain needs sleep. I'll explain to you in a few minutes why your brain needs sleep, but your brain needs to sleep or it doesn't function. That sleep debt, by the way, is cumulative. So the typical teenager will go Day, day after day after day, losing sleep, week after week, building up this 12-hour sleep debt. And so what do they do? They overuse caffeine because they believe that caffeine will help wake up their brain and get them ready to learn. By the way, um, most people think of caffeine as coming in coffee. But 
coffee is actually a minor dose of caffeine compared to what the kids use. Have you ever seen those cans called monster drinks? A monster drink has four times the amount of caffeine in it as one cup of coffee. And if you stand outside any school as the students come in the morning, you will see many of them holding those cans, trying to wake up their brains that have been working on a huge sleep debt. The problem really is somewhere between their left ear and their right ear, but it's really right behind their forehead in an area called the prefrontal cortex. This is me having my prefrontal cortex scanned, and it's a very interesting technique. They wrap a little band around your head, they shine these little lights through your skull, it reflects back off of the oxygen molecules, and it shows exactly what parts of your brain are working at any given time. If they look and find that this part of the brain is working, this is what's called the working memory area. This is the part of the brain that brings in information from the, the memory, works on it, makes decisions. If this part of the brain is activated, this is the attentional area. This means that this is how they're deciding what to attend to. And right in the middle, right at the crease, is the area that controls multitasking and impulsivity, making stupid decisions. And teenagers are known for making stupid decisions, and I'll show you why. First of all, the prefrontal cortex has a lot of functions. It's the executive controller, as I said, it's working memory, it's attention, it's decision making, it's multitasking, and it's impulse control. However, when babies are born, their nerve cells are not the same as they're going to be eventually. Um, let me see if I can find a wire here. We have a cord anywhere. Nah, I can't find a wire, it doesn't matter, they're all taped down. Imagine a cord that goes from a wall socket to a lamp, okay? Is that cord just a thin electrical wire? It has a coating on it, right? Why does it have a coating on it? It has a coating on it so you won't shock yourself. If you touch that thin electrical wire, you will get a shock, right? Babies are born with all of their neurons in their brain and everywhere in their body as thin electrical wires with no coating on them. Which is why, by the way, when babies are born, they have these kind of jerky movements and they tell you to swaddle the babies and they tell you to keep them warm and tight because their nerve cells are not working right. And what happens is as the nerve tries to send a signal out, the signal gets lost. It's like a thin electrical wire with sparks coming off it. That's kind of like what happens to babies as they're born. As they grow, these little cells called myelin, they're little fatty cells, start wrapping themselves around each nerve cell in the body. And as you grow, they wrap themselves around the nerve cells. They start in certain places in the body. That's why babies get gross motor movements sooner because they start with the nerve cells in the arms and the legs. Later on, they start in the nerve cells in the fingers so that they eventually can start picking up things. One of the later areas where they, where they go is the pathway from the bladder to the brain. Until they're coded from the bladder to the brain, the child doesn't know that it has to go to the bathroom, and so it urinates on, in its diaper because it never got the signal from the bladder saying to the brain, oh, I have to go to the go to potty, I better go now. As kids grow, eventually into adulthood, all of those neurons are covered. The last area, the very last area to be myelinated is what it's called, is this strip right here, the prefrontal cortex. And remember what the prefrontal cortex is involved in? Decision making, impulse control, attention, all of those executive functions. Now, when is it done? When are we completely myelinated? Well, here's the chart. This shows that the myelination increases starting at 15 years old, 25 years old, 35 years old. It actually peaks at about 45, but they consider somewhere in here between 25 and 30 that our prefrontal cortex is pretty much completely myelinated. So even young adults don't have a really good prefrontal cortex. They're not making really good solid decisions yet. By the way, notice that eventually after about 45, it starts to deteriorate. The, actually, the myelin that those fatty cells start to deteriorate and fall apart, which is why when we're in our 60s and 70s, we do things like we walk into the kitchen, open up the refrigerator door, and stand there and go, uh, I can't remember what I was coming here for. 
or we can't remember where we put our keys because the myelin sheath that's wrapped around those cells is deteriorating rapidly as we get into our 60s and 70s. So what does it all mean? Well, without myelin, the neurons don't work. They don't project the, the signals. The last area to be myelinated is up here in this prefrontal cortex. The prefrontal cortex is what controls all of your actions, makes all of your decisions, and this doesn't happen until the late 20s and early 30s. Now we get to technology. This is a fascinating study done by Gary Small at the University of California at Los Angeles. He had older adults who had never used a computer first put into a, a scanner, you know what an MRI machine is? Put into an MRI machine, and the first thing they did was read a book. And he scanned their brains as they read a book, and the, the sort of orangish red part is the parts of the brain that were active, that, where the oxygen flowed when they were reading a book. Then he introduced them to Google, and this is what their brain looked like when they were Googling. Technology overactivates our brains. We are finding more and more research now showing that technology is a stimulant to our brain. It overactivates areas of our brain. It's also about anxiety. And this is, this is something that, that to me is fascinating because people always ask me, are kids addicted to technology? And that term is wrong. Kids are not addicted to technology. They are obsessed with technology. And that, those words are not interchangeable. We, we tend to think, oh, I'm addicted to this, I'm obsessed with it. Those two words are the same. They're not. They're two totally different brain systems. When you are addicted to something, your job in your brain is to get some cells in, sort of in the middle of your brain to release a chemical called dopamine. And dopamine is a chemical that we learn from a very young age makes us happy. So we do things to get our brain to release dopamine to make us happy. That's addiction. And in fact, video they do a lot of research on video games, and they find that kids who play video games are always doing so to get dopamine released so they get a lot of pleasure. Anxiety is different. Obsession's different. Obsession is about anxiety. When you have an obsession, when you are obsessed about something, what happens is your brain has released chemicals that we have learned from infancy represent anxiety. And what you do is you do an activity to reduce the anxiety, actually to get rid of the chemicals. So on the one hand, you're trying to get more dopamine if you are addicted. On the other hand, you're trying to get rid of the chemicals that make you anxious. Very different processes. Anybody ever see a movie called as, um, I think it was called As Good As It Gets with Jack Nicholson? He was an obsess had obsessive compulsive disorder. Remember the things he used to do? Unlock and lock doors, unlock and lock doors, unlock, wash his hands over and over again. He had to have all of his pieces at the, table, at the dinner table all lined up exactly the same. He had to have his knife and his fork in exactly the right place. The reason he was doing that was to get rid of the chemicals that have to do with anxiety. 67% of teens and young adults check their telephones, their cell phones, every 15 minutes or less. Notice when I asked you that question, I think that before we turned it off, almost everybody said all the time that teenagers check all the time. 67% of teenagers check their phone every 15 minutes or less. If they can't check their phone, half of them claim they get anxious. It makes them anxious. Um, have you ever heard of something called phantom pocket vibration syndrome? Anybody ever felt their pocket vibrating and they grabbed their phone out of their pocket and there was no text message, there was no email, there was nothing there? It's sort of a weird thing. I mean, 10 years ago, if you felt a tingling right here, what would you think? I mean, I would have gone down and scratched it. I would have thought that's an itch. Now we grab our phone because we think we have a text message. That's anxiety. That is exactly a reflection of anxiety. And by the way, there have been two studies on phantom pocket vibration syndrome. Both studies showed that 80% of people experience it at least once a day. At least once a day. So what are they checking when they're checking anxiously on their phones? They're checking their text messages and their social media all the time, every 15 minutes or less. So let me give you a couple of studies that we've done. This is a brand new study, it's not published. We just finished it just before I left home. 
but I thought it was important enough to show you what we had. So here's the scenario. We bring college students into a big room, like this except with desks. We ended up with 163 college students. At the door, half of them put to this door, half of them are sent to this door. The half that go to this door get to keep their phones. They have to go to this door, get a, a ticket, and they have to give us their phones. We take them away. Then what the students are told is, you're just supposed to sit in this room. We're going to do something eventually, but you just sit and wait. You can't use your phone if you have it. You can't study. You can't talk. You can't do anything. And literally, if they started to talk, we threw them out of the room. You cannot do anything. And what we did is we measured their level of anxiety three different times, after 20 minutes, after 40 minutes, and after an hour. So here's what happened. Here's the group that had their smartphones with them. They did get anxious. Their anxiety went up from the, from the first 20 minutes to the second 20 minutes. Heck, if I was asked to sit in a room and do nothing, I'd be kind of anxious anyway. And then it sort of leveled off. Look at the group that we took their smartphones away. Their anxiety just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger over time. More interestingly, we asked each of them the amount of time they typically used a smartphone. Did they use it a little or a lot? So this graph, just a second and I'll show you, this graph is a little more complicated, but on the right-hand side are what we call heavy smartphone users, and on the left are what we call light smartphone users. And this axis is how much their anxiety increased. The green ones are the ones who were allowed to have their smartphone. The white bars are the ones where we took them away. Notice that the only group that really got really anxious were the heavy smartphone users where we took their phone away. What are our teenagers? They're mostly heavy smartphone users. So what happens is over time they get more and more and more anxious, more concerned. So what do we need to do with our kids to keep their brains healthy? First of all, we need to get time away from technology. They have to be able to take time away from technology. Why? Well, there's several reasons. One is because if they're always working on technology, and remember that when we talked about the primary modes of communication, they were texting, instant messaging, Facebooking, on the phone, face-to-face -face was like a distant fifth on that list. What do we learn by face-to-face -face communication? What do we learn? I'm looking at your face right now. What should I be learning from your face? My state of health and awareness. And your state of awareness? If you were smiling, what would I learn? That sounds happy. You're happy? OK. What am I learning from yours? You're sort of smiling. You're sitting here. I, I have to learn that kind of stuff, right? We don't come into the world knowing those little nonverbal cues. We come into the world not knowing anything. That's why young kids will come and interrupt their moms and tug at their pants and say things and yell because they haven't learned the, what's called the pragmatics of communication. If you're only communicating electronically, sending text messages, typing emails, posting on Facebook, doing all these kinds of technologies that are all two-dimensional, all they are are words. What they're missing is all of those communication cues, all of those really important cues that define how we are able to understand communication. One of the things we're finding in our research is the reason that there's such a rise in cyberbullying is because people who cyberbully are exactly those people who don't understand those nonverbal cues. They're not picking them up. So, one of the things, I talk to a lot of parent groups all around the world, and one of the things that I really insist on is that when your kids are young, that you do not allow them to sit and use technology all the time. That when your kids are little, the ratio of technology use to non-technology use should be one to five, meaning for every one minute of technology use, there should be five minutes of non-technology use some of which should be face-to-face -face communication, communicating with mommy, communicating with daddy, playing with friends, learning that taking a toy away makes your friend cry helps you understand those nonverbal cues. As the kids get older, though, that ratio starts to switch. As they learn those nonverbal cues, the ratio starts to switch so that usually when they're about preteen, 
it's about 50-50, meaning for every five minutes that they use technology, five minutes of non-technology. So if they're playing a computer game for a half hour, then they should do something else outside, communicating with somebody else, non-technological. As they get to be teenagers, the ratio actually flips to five to one. Five times more technology time, five minutes of technology time to one minute non-technology time, because most of their world right now is technological, it's virtual, and this is where their friends are located, and this is where they need to be. The second thing is creative thinking. Um, one of the things that research is starting to show is that creative thinking actually involves four little areas of your brain. One, two, three, four. They're disparate areas. They're called the default mode network. They are activated under three conditions. One, when you're being creative. Two, when your mind is wandering or you're daydreaming. And three, when you're asleep. If we don't allow kids to have that time, they're not sleeping enough. So if we don't allow kids to have that time to daydream, to be creative, to play with blocks, to build things, to put Legos together and make something, to do creative activities, we are actually harming them and we're not letting their brain develop. We're not letting that default mode network develop. And if it doesn't develop, then they lose this sort of ability to think creatively, to, to think deeply, to be able to ponder um, the meaning of words in a poem, for example. They get it at a very superficial level, and they can't take it to a deep level. The other thing is calmness. One of the things that happens is every single study that scans the brain shows that the brain is highly activated when you are using technology. Highly, highly, highly activated. Remember the study, Gary Small's study, where they had the older adults reading a book versus Googling? You could see the overactivity. Um, it's even worse when kids play video games. Their brains are highly, highly active. In fact, one study recently showed that that increased activity can last up to two weeks after they play video games. Up to two weeks after they play video games. So, they need some way to, to be calm. And one of the things that, that I've been trying to learn as I, as I learn more about the brain, which is my sort of new avocation in life, is to figure out what's going on be, between my left ear and my right ear as I get older, I realize that neuroscience is starting to answer those questions. It's starting to be able to tell us what will calm our brains. For example, we all now know from research that if you meditate, the activity in your brain calms down. If you exercise, if you simply do jumping jacks, the activity in your brain calms down. If you walk outside and look at trees, the activity in your brain calms down. In one study, they had two groups of people. They scanned their brains, and then they sent one group across the street where there was a busy street with lots of traffic, lots of noise, the other half of the group went across the street the other way where there was a forest. They let them just 10 minutes, they let them walk there, brought them back in, scanned their brains again. The ones who walked in the, in the city, active, active, active brain. The ones who were in nature, calm brain. A few other things that calm your brain down. Telling jokes calms your brain for some reason. Having a personal conversation. If you and I sat and talked, it would calm both of our brains but only if it was a positive conversation. If there's, there has to be, it turns out there has to be three times as many positive statements as negative statements in order for, it to, for both of our brains to calm down. I'm enjoying this lecture. Then, then we are having a good time and our brain should be calming, except that if you're paying attention, then your brain should be activated, so your brain must be going crazy at this point. Um, <laughs> laughter, telling jokes calms your brain. You know what calms your brain. You know intuitively. I mean, I know, for example, that if my brain is overloaded, if I'm busy writing and I've been typing on the computer for an hour or so, I know my brain's ready to explode. So what I do is I walk into the kitchen, I make a cup of coffee because I'm hopelessly addicted to caffeine, make a cup of coffee, I have a crossword puzzle always working on the table that my girlfriend and I work on together, so I fill in a few things on the crossword puzzle. About 10 minutes is all it takes. 10 minutes calms your brain. You know personally what calms your brain. Kids don't, unfortunately. They have no earthly clue. 
Sleep is really critical. Let me explain to you what happens during sleep because it's a mysterious process. I'm going to assume now that I'm talking about a normal, well-rested person. All right? So it may not be any of you, but assume that you're talking about a normal, well-rested person. So here's what happens. Your head hits the pillow, you fall asleep. Your brain goes through a series of stages for about 90 minutes. Those stages are part of what's called synaptic rejuvenation. What that means is that your brain is, is do you remember um, with windows, we used to do something called defragmenting windows. Remember that phrase, you had to defrag windows? That's really what your brain is doing. Your brain is defragmenting itself. During the day, your neurons are communicating. And as they communicate, they send chemicals from one to another. They also put off these little shoots called axons and dendrites. It's like a tree, right? They put up this little shoot here, this little shoot here, this one here, and this one here. At night, your brain goes through and kind of defrags that. It makes decisions, and it says, hmm, see this shoot here? Important? Nah, <laughs> clip it off. Important? Yeah, OK, then we're going to practice it. So it practices. It shoots out chemicals from it, and it practices it. So the first 90 minutes, your brain is going through this synaptic rejuvenation. It's doing what's called pruning and consolidation. Pruning is clipping off just like you prune a plant. Consolidation is practicing the connections so that they go well together and they're learned. Really, consolidation is learning. After about 90 minutes, you go into a period of sleep called rapid eye movement sleep. You've seen that, right? Where People are, their eyelids are flickering. That means they're dreaming. That means that all that consolidation and all that pruning led to a dream, led to the connections in the brain dreaming. First dream lasts about three minutes. And then you immediately go back into that 90 minute cycle of synaptic rejuvenation. And then you have a second dream. You're trying to sneak back in? <laughs> That's really pathetic. <laughs> You go through a second cycle of 90 minutes, and then you have a little bit longer dream, about 10 or 15 minutes. Then you go through another 90-minute cycle, and now you have a longer dream of about 30 minutes, and then you go through your, usually your last 90-minute cycle, and your last dream is about an hour. If you add those all up, what you, if you're a normal, well-rested person and you sleep about eight hours, you will wake up in the middle of your last dream. How many people wake up in the middle of a dream? You should, if you're a normal, well-rested person. So what happens if you're not normally well-rested? Well, if I put you in a lab and every time I see your eyelids flickering, I wake you up, then what happens? Instead of going through that 90-minute cycle, you go right into that flickering eye stage. You go right into dreaming. So what do kids do? They don't sleep enough. And so what happens is they don't get enough of that synaptic rejuvenation. What they get is dreaming, 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 and a little stuff in between where the brain is trying frantically to prune stuff, to consolidate the important stuff. They're do it's doing its best, but it's not given enough time to do it. So sleep is absolutely critical for the brain to stay healthy. The other thing it needs is periodic resetting. It would be nice, and someday we will probably have a little button, a little red button right here that says reset, right? And we'll go, and our brain will reset. It would be nice if we had one now, but periodically we need time away from technology. We need time away from technology to allow our brains to calm and reset. So what does this mean for educating our kids? There, I have basically three concerns for our students and our children. First of all, they're underdeveloped social skills. They are not getting time for communicating face to face. They are not learning social skills that include all of those kind of niceties of learning how to read facial expressions, learning how to understand that conversations go back and forth and back and forth, learning how you don't send a nasty email message to somebody or a nasty post to somebody because it may hurt their feelings. They have underdeveloped social skills. They have, as we've talked about, very shallow thinking. They have very bad learning habits. They have not been able to develop good learning habits because they continually, and I'm not going to use the word multitask because it's not accurate, they continually task switch back and forth and back and forth, that continual partial attention, back and forth. And it changes their brain. 
It's called neuroplasticity. What we're starting to find in all the research, and this is very new research, that using technology changes the connections in the brain. And in some cases, it changes them for the good. If they're using technology, for example, in an engaging environment where they are learning, then the neuroplasticity means that they're creating more of those little axons and dendrites off of the cells. It also means that as they're sleeping, those good pieces of knowledge are getting consolidated, the bad pieces of knowledge are getting pruned away, and the brain is changing. The brain is constantly changing. So as far as I'm concerned, this leads to simply three main issues. One is we have to understand the values that our learners hold. Two, we have to help them understand why their brains get distracted, and that's my goal in the long run. And three, we have to help them learn how to focus and attend. So let me first talk about values. We've done a lot of research on young kids, and we've come to the conclusion that they hold 10 values that are very different for their generation. First and foremost, social connections are everything. This is the generation that embraced MySpace. This is the generation that embraces Facebook, Instagram. Anything new comes out, this is the generation that uses it. They believe speed and immediacy are critical. This is the two seconds that they spend before they clip to another website. They believe in themselves. They've seen people like Mark Zuckerberg create a whole new thing and become a billionaire. They enjoy being creative and they have very strong, strong, strong family connections. They also have a strong work ethic. They really do. They work hard, but they're very tempted by the distracting world of technology. They prefer to work in teams. They do not like to work on projects alone. They much prefer to work in teams because teams are what social networking is all about. They prefer project deadlines, meaning tell me when a project is due, but they don't want a little piece in two days and another little piece in four days and another piece in six days. They want to know when the project is due and that is their preference. They need constant positive reinforcement, constant reinforcement, and they're motivated by time to play, to play with their technology. So how can we help them to learn? And here is Jeremy talking to his dad and he says, God, I've been waiting forever for this stupid web page to load. His dad stupidly says, how long is forever? Around four seconds, I guess. Jeremy, let me explain something to you about patience. Okay, you almost finished, I'm bored. This is what our kids are like. So how do the students study? We did a very interesting study where we went into the bedrooms of middle school, high school, and college students, and we asked them to study something important. And we said, we want you to find something important that you need to study for only 15 minutes. That's all, 15 minutes. We said, we would like you to study. Now, I assumed that if we asked them to study, they would study. And what we measured was every minute we looked over their shoulders, we measured whether they were studying, what they said they were going to study. We measured if they had a computer screen, we measured what was on the computer screen, how many windows were open. Um, we asked them later how much technology they used every day. Uh, we asked them if they preferred to work on a task and switch to another one and switch back, or did they prefer to work on a task until it was completely done. Um, we asked them if they had study strategies, and then as a way afterthought, we asked them, what's your grade point average? Seemed like a stupid question. I don't know why we included it, but it turned out to be interesting. So here's what happens. Here's our 15 minutes of observations. Here is the percentage of time they're on task. So for the first couple minutes, they're as focused as they're gonna get. By the way, only 70% of them were on task. Even though they knew we were watching them, 70% were on task. They were doing other stuff. All of a sudden, they get distracted. And then they try to focus again. And then they get really distracted at about the 8 to 10 minute mark. They're just lost there. And then they start to focus again. We think this is because they finally realize after about 14 or 15 minutes, oh, wait, we're, they're watching me. I better start studying again. But you notice that at about minute 15, they start to, to, to lose focus again. They just can't hold their focus. And if you look, it's about three to five minutes on the average they can focus. Research has been done with computer programmers and medical students, and they find exactly the same results. Three to five minutes. Now, the medical student part scares me. 
because they watched medical students studying in a medical library where they were supposed to be studying their books three minutes before they switched, and almost always they switched to check their email. So we also measured how many windows were open from minute one to minute 15. Look what happens. By the way, notice where more, more windows are open? Right at that eight to 10 minute mark where they started to really lose it. And the students who were most off task were the ones that had the most windows open, the most distracting part. Now, this was the part that I thought was really interesting because I don't know why one of my students suggested we ask their grade point average. Turns out this to me was the most fascinating part. So we asked what predicts their grades? Of all the, everything they're doing, what predicted their grades? So not surprisingly, those who were able to stay on task longer had better grade point average. That makes sense to me. Those that had study strategies, that knew how to study, had better grade point averages. Those who preferred to go work on a task, work on another one, work on one, work on another one, that continuous partial attention, lower grade point averages. Those who had more daily media consumption, lower grade point averages. And now this is the worst one I've ever, worst result I've ever seen. If they check Facebook just once during the 15 minutes, they had a lower grade point average. No other website showed the same effect. Why? What about Facebook? I mean, it didn't matter how many times they checked it. Why? Because Facebook is where their social world is. And as soon as they checked their social world, they were being distracted. So why can't they focus? What, what is it about focus? First of all, it's stuff in the outside world. We talked before, it's the alerts that come from their smartphones, it's the phantom pocket vibration syndrome. But also television does it too. When I was growing up, and maybe when you were also, television shows were very different. The scenes were about three to five minutes long. They dwelt on a scene, it was played out, and then they changed the scene and it was played out. Now the scenes are like 30 to 45 seconds. When my kids grew up, they watched Sesame Street. That was a big show for them. And I watched Sesame Street with them. And even Sesame Street, very slow, let's talk about the letter M today. And then Oscar the Grouch talked about the letter M for three minutes. Now, every 30 to 45 seconds, there's a scene change on television. It's also the same for magazines, for newspapers, for everything. When I grew up, the magazines had four or five articles in an entire magazine. Now, if you read a magazine, there are about 300 articles in a typical magazine. But it's also happening inside the brains. And one of the introductions before somebody said weapons of mass destruction, really they are weapons of mass distraction because they are distracting us. First of all, there's this thing called the human orienting response. That's what causes us to grab our phone when our pocket vibrates. We are taught to orient to outside stimuli. But it's the inside stuff that's the problem. Their brain is always thinking. This is why when they checked Facebook just once, it predicted that they had a lower grade point average. Their brain is always thinking, always worrying. It's all about a concept called metacognition. And metacognition is really composed of a few parts. First of all, it's knowing how you best learn. Second of all, it's really knowing how your brain works. And this is something we should be teaching our students, is knowing how your brain works. And then it's knowing under which conditions you best learn. It's knowing that, gee, I might need to turn off all the websites on my computer because they're distracting. I might need to put my phone away because it's distracting. Students don't know that. So what distracts them the most? Texting, email, and social media. And I love this. These kids are all texting at the same time as they're mowing the lawn, and they're all going to crash. And I don't know if you ever heard the story, but there's, there was this really popular story two years ago where this young woman was, was walking in a mall and she was texting and she was so oblivious that she fell into a fountain. She literally fell into a fountain. Now, I always thought that was funny until I was texting one day and I walked into a tree. <laughs> and I'm not gonna ask you if you've ever done that, but I suspect there are some of you that have bumped into somebody while you were texting or looking at your phone. These are very distracting technologies. So, I'm gonna give you a very simplistic method of how we can work with our kids. It's really called the ABC method. It's three parts. The A is make our learners aware of what distracts them, 
aware of the options that they should metacognitively be dealing with. They need to be aware of what distracts them. They have no clue. They don't know when they stop to pick up their phone that it is distracting. A study came out yesterday where they had students do a task on a computer, and every few minutes, it was a simple task, but it was a sequential task. So they had to do something, and then do something, and then do something, and then do something. Every few minutes, two letters came up on the screen, and all they had to do was type those two letters, and then they had to resume the task. They split them into two groups. One group had the two letters come up on the screen, the other group didn't. The group that had the two letters come up on the screen did half as well on the task and took longer on the task, just typing two letters. Two letters are things like JK, just kidding, on your cell phone, LOL, on your cell phone. They need to be aware that those kind of activities are distracting and what they do to the brain. They rush the oxygen away from what they're studying and they have to reinvigorate it, and that takes time and energy. Second thing is they have to learn to calm and reset their brain. All those kind of activities they have to do. Um, I talk to parents about helping your kids learn how to do this, and one of the things that I tell them is, look, every hour, send your kids outside for 10 minutes. Doesn't matter what they're doing, every hour, send them outside. Every hour, make them do some activity that we know calms their brain. Make them do jumping jacks, make them talk to somebody, make them have a phone conversation with some friend, make them do something that is not going to activate their brain, calm and reset their brain. And then they need to learn metacognition. They need to learn to make those good choices. And that's the most difficult part in teaching our learners because they don't make good choices at all. They simply don't and we have to. So if you, can you read that? If you can read that, you're pretty young at heart. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Thank you.